Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Mileha, and I work in the Netherlands, but I originally come from India. So um, I think some of you might know this. Uh, in India, we have huge families, yeah? And for me, that meant, oh my god, so many family gatherings to attend, so many events. And as a child, my parents dragged me to these family gatherings. I was extremely annoyed. But the one thing I remember enjoying thoroughly was playing around with my cousins, jumping around and having so much fun. And there was this one uncle who always had games for us. He was jumping around with us kids as well and was the center of our attention, let's put it like that. He was extremely successful in his career. I always saw him as a powerful person. But then, this hale and hearty person suddenly deteriorated in health. He was diagnosed with Parkinson's. Now, most of you know, Parkinson's is a disease that causes degeneration of the nervous system. But what it meant for my uncle was that he immediately got tremors. He could not drink that easily. He could not write that easily. But he also started using a walker to walk. So he would take one step at a time. And even to take a turn, he literally had to do this. And it took him forever. So what I did was, as, as a designer, I decided to you know, just do something about this. I said, I'm going to design a solution for him. Now, as, uh, as designers, we sometimes think of these multifaceted problems. And we think, you know what? I'm going to create one solution for it all, one big fancy solution that solves it all. But that was not my approach. What I did was I said, OK, let's break down the problem. But while I was designing this, uh, what I did not do was define special needs, because my uncle fits the definition of special needs. And Marie elaborated about it quite well as well. Uh, so I'm going to try with you to let's together define who fits the definition of special needs. Most of us think it's not us, but each and every one of us in the, this room fits this definition at some point in their lives. Let's see. I'm going to use the definition of disabled. Uh, I know Marie did it as well, but I'm going to use the traditional definition. A person having a physical or mental condition that limits their movements, senses, or activities. Anyone associate themselves with this definition right now? Raise your hands. Yeah. <laughs> You have a brace, I know that. You as well. So let's say, that, so my uncle or someone in a wheelchair, someone who's blind, fits the permanent definition of special needs. But someone who's maybe tripped, broken their ankle, or you know, has a broken arm, fits the temporary definition of special needs. But some of you are thinking, OK, how do we fit this? But Imagine holding heavy grocery bags and trying to turn a knob. It's really difficult. And if you're looking at a phone and the sun is blinding you, yeah, you're partially blind. The situations around you make you fit this definition of special needs. So that is the situational definition of special needs. So the moment we start de designing for permanent disability, we not only the solve the problem for someone with a temporary disability, but also someone with a situational definition of special needs. So in the end, what we end up doing is we design for all. And that's something that I actually wanted to elaborate. And while designing for my uncle, I had a similar mindset. And I was using the def uh, sort of the principles of inclusive design and human-centered design. So Microsoft defines it as a design methodology that enables and draws on the full range of human diversity. 
So these were the principles I was using. But let's get back to what I actually did with these principles. Coming back to my uncle, I was asking him a lot of questions. I was interviewing a lot of Parkinson's patients to sort of break down what are their major problems, right? One major problem my uncle said was he loved drinking chai, which is basically Indian tea. And it's a very social thing to do with everyone around you. But he had stopped doing that completely. Just out of embarrassment, just out of feeling, oh my God, I'm going to spill it, you know? And I don't want to do that. At home, he would take a huge cup and take little tea, so that even got, though he had tremors, it wouldn't spill out. So that's the way he solved the problem for himself. I tackled this problem, and I designed the no-spill cup. It purely works on the form on top, so every time they have tremors, the liquid just deflects inside, and it avoids massive spillage outside with the normal cup. Now, when I was designing this, I was thinking extremely complicated, and I was thinking of a very heavy cup, a stabilizing cup, etc. And then I thought, you know what, let's think of the form. How can we solve it with simply using the form? And this is what I came up with. There were a lot of ergonomic factors as well that went into it. So uh, the handle was such that you hold it close. Psychologically, it would avoid spillage. But the key here was that it's not a cup designed for only special needs. It was a cup that could be used by you, me, any clumsy person, you know. And that's what makes it much more inviting for them to use the products. They, they feel included. They are not different. We're all a part of it. So let's be clumsy. Let's use this cup. A kid could use this cup and not spill that much. So that uh, made this product basically successful. Now, going back to my story, I was asking a lot of questions and getting answers to only my questions. So what I did was I decided, you know what, I'm going to just observe, just shadow my uncle, just see what he does every day, how he walks to his table, how he watches TV, whatever he does and then see what are the problems, because sometimes they also don't know what actions they're doing and what the problems they're facing. So then, uh, as I said, my uncle used to walk uh, quite hesitantly with a walker, and then it struck me that he lives on the first floor of a building. He has to climb the staircase because he does not have a stair lift in his house. So I'm like, if it's so difficult to walk on flat land, how do you climb a staircase? He said, let me show you how I do it. Let's take a look at what I saw. So he took really, really long to get to the edge of the staircase. and then suddenly it was not a problem at all. The turn, he took them so easily. Shocked? Yeah, I was too. So this person who found it so difficult to walk on flat land was a pro at climbing stairs and this made me research this a bit further, and I realized it's actually a visual continuity that helps them. Now, there's someone else who discovered that a person suffering from Parkinson's loses all their symptoms when they're cycling, because it's a v continuous motion, it helps them. So they cycle freely and they lose all their sort of symptoms. So I went back home, uh, I rushed to create a quick prototype, 
and I ran back to my uncle's house that evening itself and tested it out. So let's take a look at the idea and I'll speak a bit more about it after that. It's a bit covered by the subtitles, but it's a simple print of a staircase on the floor. I call this the staircase illusion. As I said, it was a simple print on the floor. If some of you saw it, it's really stuck with cello tape, A3 sheets sort of attached together. Another principle I applied is just quickly prototype it, test it immediately. If it fails, if it works, improve on it and continuously test, improve. Um, and this way, as, uh, as Marie as well said, you sort of co-create with your user. You understand what works for them. You don't understand. You ask them questions. You go back with more insights. So I call this the staircase illusion. Now, some of you observed it. Um, when my uncle was walking on it and the staircase illusion abruptly ended, he sort of froze. This is called freezing of gait. Now, why not have a continuous staircase illusion flowing through all their rooms? making them feel much more comfortable in their environments, making them feel confident and powerful. And, you know, uh, a lot of people I show this to tell me, why not make it a projection and, you know, a Google Glass projecting it right in front of them while they walk on it? Yeah, my answer to that is, let's keep it simple. Print works on the floor. This print can be put anywhere. Uh, you saw how projector <laughs> things are complicated, right? This person is someone who's an elderly person who's not used to technology, who doesn't want to stand out with these fancy gadgets on himself. Let's keep it simple. Print, put it on the floor in hospitals, in uh, railway stations, everywhere to make them much more comfortable and confident in our environments. Sometimes I think we think too high tech. Now, Smart has become synonymous to high-tech, right? But what was its definition originally? It was simple and effective, something that fits your user's context. So let's use human-centered design principles. Let's use the understanding of the humans and make it simple and effective and design for more you know, human-centeredness. So that's basically my message. Let's make a smarter world but with simplicity. Thank you so much.